drums pounding, horns ringing, and everything else. But appreciate you guys. Got a lot of people out of town this weekend from both campuses, and uh, amazing. We just keep on going. Amen. We just, the only thing we need is the Holy Spirit working in us, working with us. Amen, guys. Amen. Hallelujah. That's a great song. After after the morning service at Magnolia, uh, right before I got to preach, they sang, "Let the river flow." That's a different. Brings whole new meaning today, doesn't it? People just south of Conroe or east of Conroe are praying, don't let the river flow. So their houses are going under. Be praying for those folks who are in some bad areas. Amen. Uh, we got it pretty mildly here. I see over there. We that must have rained about three inches at my house in about, about an hour and a half. It just, the bottom fell out. And uh, I'm not going to complain. We desperately need the rains. Amen. Uh, glad that the, officially, I think the drought is broken. And uh, mine is at least. I don't know about everybody else's. Hey, we're in this message called In the Last Days, and this is part two, times like these. And we've been dealing with the characteristics of the end time people. This is the generation at large in the last of the last days as we're talking about it. And as we looked at this passage, we, we looked in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And let's just, look, let's just read it again, and we'll continue with it because we only got about halfway through it. Verses 1 through 5, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult or perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they denied its power, avoid such men as these. Now, last week we talked about what this word has to do in, in regard to uh, perilous and talking about perilous times that will come in the last days. We said in the Greek language, this word was used in three different ways. We talked about how it was used as a medical term and how to describe an ugly, infected, and dangerous wound that could be life-threatening. We also talked about how the Greeks used this term in, in a spiritual way in uh, dealing with demons in regard to someone whose life was totally controlled by the demonic, such as in, in Mark chapter 5 with the maniac of the, of the Gadarenes. And then also it was used to talk about in, in astronomical terms when pa planets collide or meteors, there'd be this violent collision that would take place. The apostle says that's what the days are going to be like. Now you wonder why I refer a lot to the Greek language or to the Hebrew language because the, that's what the Bible was given to us in. That's what the Holy Scriptures were inspired uh, to men and, and, and who spoke Greek and who spoke Hebrew. And it's, they took this, this language. Now we have it in the English translation. But many times our English words just fail us uh, desperately to describe the kind of things that the Bible is talking about, such as this word difficult or perilous. When you look at it in this kind of format, you see there's a lot more to this word than meets the eye in the English language. In other words, the last days are going to be ugly, right? It's going to be infectious. It's going to spread. It's going to ooze out into other people's lives. It's going to be com communicable kind of thing going on. But not only that, it, it would be a time to be marked with great demonic activity. In fact, the apostle went on later to say that even the church would have to deal with this issues because what would happen in the last days is there would be an invasion of what it was called the didascalius demonis in the Greek language, it means doctrines of devils would invade the church, all right? And then it goes on beyond that. It's just violent times that we're living in. And certainly you only have to turn on the news for a little bit to see that all these descriptions adequately match the times and the season of which we find ourselves in in these days. But then Paul goes on and lists uh, and this is one of several lists that the apostle uses. It's like one in Romans chapter one. It talks about the godlessness of the last days. But he lists 19 words here to describe the, the characteristic of the people who would be living in the final times. And these 19 words, we, we discussed of the 19, eight last week. So let's just overview real quick. He said they'd be self-loving. They would be covetous. We talked about the word meant self-indulgent lovers of silver. They would be boastful. Of course, that just all these follow, you know, kind of like building one upon the other like dominoes falling. Once you're self-loving, that sets off everything. All right. Covetous, boasters, blasphemers, you know, was, was the word here that's used for arrogant. And it had to do with defaming other people and, and putting them down just to elevate yourself because you're self-loving. We just talked about the word reviler, 
the disobedient to the per, to parents. And remember, as we looked at that word, and it was a very interesting word. It basically means to be self-ordained. In other words, God has put authority over your lives, but we don't want that authority over our lives. So we reject it and we surrender to another authority, our own. At least we think that's what it is. And it's self-ordained. We just ordain ourselves as the one who has the final word and everything. I don't want to listen to what people say, so I'll do what I want. And then we looked at the word ungrateful. And that certainly is a characteristic that goes back to self-loving. The only thing you appreciate is yourself. And then we went into this, the, the unholy and what that meant in, in regard to being focused upon only your own desires and passions. Now, from that, he goes on with another. You know, there, there's 11 more in the list that we'll look at quickly each one of those as we wrap this part of this message up and part of this series up. He uses the word, the ninth characteristic is the word unloving. All right. And it translates from the Greek language as astorge. Now, the word partnership remember, has an A in front of it, like atheist. It's a, it's a negative. All right. Storge, though, is a word which has to do with love. You know, astorge being the negative part of it. The storge has to do with family love. Remember in the Greeks, they use several different words for love. We, we have one word, you know, I love you. I love Dr. Pepper. I love that TV show. I love my socks or whatever, you know, they were a little more specific in, in saying what they, how, what love was. One was a word for phileo, for brotherly love. Like we get the word Philadelphia from. Then there's that word, that godly love, the, the, that selfless kind of love, which is God demonstrates for us. It's that agape love. And so we talked about those different kinds of love. But there's another word in the Greek language has to do with a family love. Brother, sister, mother, father, all right? Husband, wife. That's storge. These people says are without family love. Boy, I don't know. I, I was raised in a time when family was important, all right? I tried to teach my children how important family was. But this is a different time. People really don't put any emphasis upon family family, familial love. There's, there's no, now they say they love their family, but yet they live their lives in such a way they really don't care if it harms their family. You, you, you with me on this? You know, you know I, I love my, oh, I love dad. I love mom. I love brother. I love sister. But, but the way you live your life says, no, you don't because it shows your concerns are about, about yourself. You see, first and foremost, I believe God gives us this kind of love. All right. It's, it's, it's kind of, it should be a natural thing that develops. I love my mother. I love my father. They've demonstrated a love to teach me how to love. Now, it's natural, first and foremost, not to love God. All right. We're sinners by nature. We're the enemies of God. We must be reconciled to God. God gives us a love for himself. The Bible says we don't come to God because we love him. It says he first loved us. All right. And that when we come to Christ, though, he gives us a an agape, it's born in a heart. We have this love of God that is given to us as a free gift. It's not natural, but what should be natural is a love for family and a love for, for, for our, our, our relationships. And literally King James puts, so they were without natural affection. Now, a lot of people take this and relate it to the homosexual issue. And you certainly could, because that is certainly anti-family and the structure of the family and the institution of the family and the institution of marriage. This goes even beyond that. It has to do with the person, you know, who just has no common affection for those who, whom he should have affection for. His mother, his father's brother, his sister, his wife, the spouse. They're unloving. In other words, they care nothing for the welfare of those that they should care for because they are the ones that are closest to them. They should be the dearest to them, right? So that's the, the ninth characteristic. And then he moves from there to unreconcilable or irreconcilable, it might say in your translation. Those are people who refuse to change. They won't be reconciled. No matter how desperate their own situation becomes, they are still not going to be restored or reconciled. This kind of person, as the scriptures describe, is the person who's going to have their own way. They are determined to have their own way regardless of the consequences, even if it knowingly destroys their own lives or the lives of the people that they supposedly care about. They're not, going to, they're not going to restore. They're not going to reconcile. I want my way and my way is the most important thing. That's, that's their mindset. They, they don't forgive. If I've been offended, you can't be forgiven. That's the mindset. You hurt me. That's it. It's over. We're done. Irreconcilable. And not only that, do they not forgive, they don't care about being forgiven. Doesn't register. They don't, they don't, they don't care if you forgive me or not is the mindset here. There's no compromise. There's no reconciliation. There's no court of appeals. Now we see this a lot in, in marriages, obviously, all right? I, I see this in churches at the same time. People who get mad with somebody else in the church or somebody offended by somebody else in the church and they're just not gonna restore. Well, I just don't do that. 
You know, you hurt me, that's over between us. You had your shot, you had your best chance, so it's done. That's the kind of person that's being described here. That'll kill a family, it'll kill a marriage, it'll kill a church when people become that way. The 11th quality here of these end time folks, it says they are malicious gossips, all right? King James puts it this way, they are false accusers. And again, it gets back to this self-love. I'm going to accuse you if you appear to be over me or bigger than me or better than me. I'm going to put you in your place and show you that you're really not. I'm above all things. The world focuses on me. The world centers around me. And so if I have to gossip, make up a story, whatever it is, this kind of person will make it a point to harm someone that might be in the path of their own prosperity or their own success or their own interest or their own desires. Now, it's usually with this kind of individual is to, they, they'll, be, they'll become this malicious gossip so as to promote themselves over somebody else, their own interest. Or they might do it to, to express their, their hatred towards somebody or they're jealous of them or they just want to vent their anger. But ultimately, they take place, they take pleasure in damaging somebody else's reputation. It kind of goes back to that defaming we talked about earlier. It says that blasphemy, what that word meant last week. They'll just put people down. But the idea, not just they don't put people down, they take pleasure in doing it. They're malicious in it, malicious gossip. It translates in the Greek language, this will sound familiar, diablos. This is the word used uses here, diablos. It suggests that the, the obviously the severity of the evil, we, remember we talk about Satan, uh, we, we use the term, well, that's just diabolical, right? And we refer to that sense. But diablos basically means accuser, accuser. What, is it, what does God refer to and Jesus refer to the devil as? The accuser of the brethren. Always accusing, always making accusation. And in fact, it's used 34 times in the New, New Testament as a title for the devil. 34 times the devil's given this, this title of be, the, being the accuser the malicious gossip. And many times it's just gossip to elevate yourself. Did you hear about the preacher who preached on gossip? They followed up with an invitation on him called, I love to tell the story. <laughs> you gotta be careful. It's one of the most deadly sins I think in the church. In fact, it's one of those sins that's listed on the sins that God hates in Proverbs chapter six. We recently studied Proverbs chapter six. We're going through Proverbs on Wednesday nights. And uh, in, in chapter six, we read in verse 19 about how God hates a false witness who utters lies and spreads strife among the brethren. Boy, this is a, a terrible sin within the church that will kill and destroy any church. People just start saying stuff which has no foundation other than they heard it from somebody else. And the story goes on and on until people are hurt and people are ruined, lives are destroyed. Ephesians puts it this way, let the bitterness and the wrath and the anger and the clamor and the slander be put away from you along with your malice and be kind to one another, be tenderhearted, be forgiving one another, just as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven you. We're not to be malicious gossips. We're supposed to do it. We're supposed to be reconciled. But if we're irreconcilable, then we won't be reconciled, which leads us to number 12. And again, the dominoes are falling. Reckless is the, is, is the verse in King James that uses it as incontinent. Y'all know what incontinent means most of the day, right? I do, I need to give further definition. Incontinent, that person who can't control themselves, maybe it's a bladder problem or whatever, they can't control. But literally the word has to do with the, being a person who has lost control, but not of his bladder, all right? He's lost control of his life. He's, he's out of control. He's become a slave to what he wants, his passions, his desires. The Bible says in the last days, men's belly would be their gods. That's what it's talking about. That's just what I want. You're doing this, destroying your life. You try to tell them, but I want to do it. That's what I like. That's what I, they've lost control. There's no discipline in life. They can't say no to something now. They put it off so long. They're like a driverless car. And I, I hear all these news stories about the driverless cars. Does that scare anybody else? <laughs> There's a lot of people running around like this, haphazardly driving down the road like a drunk, crashing into stuff and careening into traffic. Whatever gets in the way, they just run over it. That's this idea of the person who's reckless, who's, who's without control in their life. It's amazing. This is so much, so descriptive of where we are in our generation and culture, isn't it not? The next word is, well, King James puts it fierce, but it's the word in the American sense. It says brutal, all right? 
And this refers to, to someone who, who's like a savage wild beast. You know, they, they just destroy whatever gets in their way. They attack their enemies. They tear them in pieces. And in fact, anytime that you choose to center your world around yourself and self-love, which is the dominant characteristic, which all this flows out of, when self-love is not checked, it makes you insensitive and eventually malicious towards other people and eventually brutal toward other people. This is our culture. This is where we live. People are acting violently and brutally without any care, without any cause. You, you see it on the news every night. Somebody being attacked and somebody being struck and somebody being murdered what, just, and, and without any conscious thought by the person who's doing the action. It's a brutal culture that we're living in this, in the end times. The 14th, it calls haters of good. And literally it means to hate what should be loved and loving what should be hated. That's what it has to do with. It's the word alafila. There's that word for, for loving others in it, but it has that negative participle, the A right up front of it means that they don't love other people. They're despisers of other people. They despise what's good. If you follow the course of this, it's like now they're sinking to this animal level, you know, but they're unlike animals. Animals know what's good for them and they usually respond to that, right? <laughs> They sink to a different level. They know what's good. They know what they should do. They know what's right here, but they choose to not just not do it. Here it says they, they, they oppose it. They despise it. The prophet Isaiah said this about this generation. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. This is certainly where we are. The Lord warned the wicked who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. They're haters of good, it says. This is certainly the generation that coddles the homosexual and demonizes the saints of God and demonizes the, the, the things of God and they do it under the name of compassion. And anybody who would dare say anything against that element of the culture of society is considered mean and evil and, 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 and hard and cruel and unloving. Christians should be unloving. I love what an argument I read the other day by a homosexual person. Well, Jesus said it was okay. And their argument was Jesus telling the immoral woman that, you know, uh, your sins are forgiven. And that was the argument. Well, there, there was an immoral sexual act like homosexuality in the context of Scripture. It's ungodly, it's immoral, and Jesus is forgiving it. But they forgot to quote the last part of the verse, go and sin no more. <laughs> this is the culture we've come to. They do go and sin more. It's haters of good. Anybody that stands for good is laughed at, ridiculed, called a fool. 15, treacherous. King James Version, traitors. Means to give someone over into the hands of an enemy. So the self-loving person eventually becomes treacherous. Turn against even their own family. They turn against even their own friends. And they betray them. I read this little quote the other day. It says, it's like the domino effect. It says, treachery comes naturally to a person who loves money, who's boastful, who's arrogant, who's ungrateful, who's unholy, who's unloving, and who's irreconcilable, becomes a malicious slander, loses self-control, and they become brutal and hate what is good. This is what Jesus warned would happen in the end times in Matthew 10, also in Matthew 24. Similar words, brother will deliver up brother to death. And a father will even his own child, and the children will rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death, and you will be hated by all men on account of my name. This brought to real clarity when we first started doing ministry after the Iron Curtain fell in Bulgaria. We went over there several years after that's when we began our ministry there in Bulgaria. And I remember sitting in a meeting in Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria, in the evangelism, the, the evangelicals all have a united uh, uh, group that they participate in. And I, I was sitting in the office and, and the, the president of each one of the major denominations in Bulgaria was there. The Methodists were there, the Assemblies of God there, the Pentecostals, I mean, uh, the, the Baptists, the Nazarenes, every denomination was in that meeting representing their denomination. One of the things we were discussing is what would we, what would we teach the coming year in the pastor's conference that could really help pastors out. And we've been teaching on prayer and spiritual warfare and family life and just theology and, you know, the basic doctrines. So one of the questions that came up and almost by every one of them is, we have a problem here since the Iron Curtain fell. We'd like for you to know how, how you would address it. We have, uh, most everybody in this room has gone through 
multiple times in jail, beatings, persecutions, you know, all the things that they went through. He said, but we have, there's a small element of pastors within the evangelical churches who never suffered anything. And it was pretty clear the reason they never suffered anything because they were betraying us. They were traitors. Now, this is the actual mindset that's being used when he talks about, you know, treacherous here. They were concerned about their welfare, their benefit, their safety. So in turn, to, to provide for themselves, they betrayed others. This is the culture, again, of that generation, which wasn't too many years ago from where we are right here and right now. And whenever the church has suffered persecution, true believers have always been betrayed to the hands of their oppressors by people that were known by them, family members, people they loved, who thought that they were safe with. But yet, when it comes down to self-control, everything else spins out of control. When you self-love, everything else spins out of control. And we want what's best for us. If you want to know what we told those guys, you'll have to come back and catch the next sermon. <laughs> 16 has to do with, again, what follows the next thing. Use the word in King James, heady, but the word is basically means reckless. They're careless. They're negligent. They're rash. The characteristic, it doesn't seem to be as serious as some of these things we just mentioned, but think for that just a moment what that really means. This self-centered person is so preoccupied with their own interests, nobody else exists in the world. Just what I want, what's important to me, what I like. If it's convenient for me, I'll care about you. If it fits in my schedule, I'll care about you. Oh, or, 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 don't miss it. If it makes me feel good, I might care for you. If I get something out of this, maybe some attention, some notoriety, some fame, then I'll do something. But in other, other words, or in the rest of the time, they really don't even recognize and notice the people around them and the things that are around them unless it's somehow associated with their own egotistical desires. It's this word, heady. It goes beyond conceit. It gets to that mindset, you know, well, there's just a lot of people that feel that, hey, when I lay my head down at night and I go to sleep, the world stops. You know, and I'm, we're, the rest of the world's on pause while I get my rest. And when I get up, God hits the play button and the world goes back into motion. And everything's about me and everything's around me. You know, it's, it, the world centers and tilts on its axis and I happen to be the center of that axis. That's so much of exactly where we are, we are at in this world in which we're living. People, want, and, and it's interesting, this, the concept that this betrays, it, it uses this word heady or reckless, negligent, negligent. They just don't take time to consider other people or other things, which, which kind of leads to the, the 17th, which is, he says here, that they're just conceited. Hit the right button here. They're conceited. I goes, I think, saying that self-lover is conceited. King James uses this word high-minded, which simply means they have a higher estimation of themselves than what, they, than, than what is reality or what should be justified. Where, do they, where does that come from? They think they're the king of the world, you know? Where, do, where does that mindset come from? It's, it's interesting when you look at the root word of this particular meaning in the Greek language, it's the word tufu, T-U-P-H-O-O. is the way we translate it in English, tufu. And it literally means to be in a smoke screen, to be to be in, be in a cloud and clouded by smoke. Now, if you're in the military and you want to make a strategic move, many times a smoke screen will be laid down. Why? So the enemy doesn't see what's happening. All right? So you're moving. Hey, you're the enemy here. You're on the devil's hit list. He's always laying down a smoke screen. You think you're in charge. You think you've got the world by the tail. You think everything's marvelous and your life's falling apart and you're living in a cloud. You don't even know what's going on around you. This, this headiness and this conceit that's entered in your, your life is, is you're running right towards the pit and you don't even realize you're about to fall in. Proverbs 12 puts it this way, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But a wise man will listen to counsel. I'm right, I'm right. I don't, and, and even if I'm not right, I'm right because I think I'm right. And he might, no, you may think that's right. and You may be right, but I'm still right. I know God's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I love God, but I'm still right. This is, this is living in a smoke screen, folks. It's conceit. Now, there's a little funny the other day. It said psychiatrists have discovered that conceit is a disease. It's a strange ailment that makes you think you're fine and makes everybody else sick. 
Amen. That's a pretty good definition. All right, I'm going to put it this way. You think you're the fountain of wisdom and you're barely a squirt. <laughs> Conceit. Living in the smoke screen. The 18th is this. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. All right. It's one single Greek word, philodonis, and the word philo is that part which actually means, to, again, that, that brotherly love. So you, you, the, just like you would love your brother, instead you love your pleasure. Adonis is the word we get hedonists from. That person who's just only concerned in his life about uh, it fulfilling without any limits his, 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 whatever it might be, whether it's sexual satisfaction or food or comfort or any other indulgence, you know, all those things that we can associate with hedonism, this is where this person's heading. And depraved, depraved, depraved pleasure is not that he loves more than God, all right? I mean, a lot of people love their sin more than they love God, but he just loves this rather than God. You know, this becomes their God. This be the, the satisfaction of their appetites, my desires, what I want, that's more important than anything else. Here's what Jesus says about this in John 3, 19. This is judgment that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light for their deeds were evil. What's he saying? Rather than loving light, they love darkness. Rather than worshiping God, we worship ourselves. Rather than, than believing and trusting and obeying God, we just want to commit to our own selves. The pleasure is what is their, ultimately their God. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. 19 says they will, this is, this is the hard part. They will hold to a form of godliness, but deny the power of it. That's, that's the ultimate description here is, is a form of godliness. I love Jesus, but then all these elements are part of their life. But I love Jesus. What's it scripture say? Woe to them, you know, that call evil good and good evil. Woe to them. Jesus rebuked the scribes and the Pharisees because this was where they, this, this outlined them perfectly. The only thing they were concerned about was the outward form. And by the way, that word form is, is a word that might be f familiar with. It's morphosis, you know. Uh, it's the word morphos in the Greek language. It means just an outward shape or an appearance like a shadow. We see a shadow on the stage here. That's, that's just a shadow. It's not the real thing. It's, it's only a shadow. And he says here, what they do is they have a shadow of godliness. They have, a, they have an outline of godliness. And Jesus said, you, you're, he said, don't be like the scribes and the Pharisees. You know, they make white the outside of the sepulcher, but it's just full of dead men's bones. It's a grave. It's, it's, it's all it is. But they'll make it look pretty. He said, they make sure that the outside of the cup is clean and disregard what the inside has. Sound like some of the restaurants you've eaten at? <laughs> it looks good. Just make sure it all looks appears good. And I, and I know I, I, I probably are tired of me using this illustration, but it's, it's so appropriate. Because again, we've come to that season of the year and we have all the award shows. And I'll take about as much of them as I can stomach for a while. I finally have to go throw up. How many times has some singer who just did the most godless, filthy, pornographic, video has gotten up and said, I just owe it all to Jesus. Or some Hollywood actor who just made this movie promoting every kind of immorality from homosexuality to fornication, every vile word poured out of their mouth. And they said, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the Lord Jesus. I can only thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Or some country singer gets up and just sang about getting drunk and losing everything and still just wanting to get another beer and sit on the pier and drink another beer, whatever it might be. <laughs> Lost his best friend. All he can do is go drink another beer. If it wasn't for the Lord Jesus, I wouldn't be here. Well, there's a lot of truth in that. But the best thing to happen for those people to realize the truth of that, you know, he said, it's a form of godliness. Now, I'm not the judge nor the jury, all right, but I do know this. Jesus said you would know them by their fruits. I'm not in a place to judge. I can't say because you live that way, you're going to hell. That's God's business. Only God can do it. But I can say that's not what the Bible says. That's not the way God tells us to live. That's not the kind of character we're supposed to demonstrate. You can't, you can't say that you love God and still live for the world. That's, it's, it just doesn't work. That's called a form of godliness. And there's one sign of the time that emanates in every passage that refers to these days or the last days from the Old Testament to the last book written in the New Testament. And it's always the sign of a people who would look religious, sound religious, put on a religious format, but would still live for themselves. Jesus says, if any man will come after me, self goes. You must deny yourself, take up the cross and follow me. 
holding to a form. They're just basically, in the context of this passage, it's what Jesus said to the Pharisees. You're fake, you're phony, religionists. You masquerade as Christians, but you claim to be servants of God. You claim to be teachers of the word of God. You're just servants of Satan and purveyors of his lies, is what Jesus told the scribes and the Pharisees. Blind leaders of the blind fall in the ditch. You are snakes, you are vipers, a generation. That's what Jesus said to these people. So I think I've been pretty nice about it. Amen. Now, those are the 19 characteristics. So the question comes up, and we're going to discuss this in weeks to come here in more specific details about our church, our families, our personal hearts, our own holiness. Those areas we'll deal with how we, re, how we live our lives in these days. How do we navigate, navigate the difficult days? That are, how do we navigate the stormy seas of the end times? All right? But he gives us a little nutshell here when he says, know this in the last days, perilous times shall come. We talked about last week in that regard, the, the men of Issachar. They were men who understood the times. We as Christians, we've got to get a grip on the day that we live in. You need to know these are the last days. And these elements that it talks about, these characteristics will only grow exponentially as they are in the day that we're living in to characterize the end times. So he says, you need to be aware of what's going on. The second thing I want to leave you with today out of three things here is what he says here. He said, last words in this verse five, avoid such men as these. True believers are given a standing order to reject false teachers, false doctrines, and false standards that these people live by. Don't be the person who looks around and says, oh, they're Christians and they do that, so I can do that. They're not your standard. The word of God is your standard. Everybody in this church may go off backsliding, get high as a kite night and go home, get drunk on Memorial Day. That doesn't mean I'm going to. Amen. Amen. Everybody in the church might do that. Everybody in every church in town might do that. But they're not the standard I live by. This is God's word. This is what we live by. You say, well, I don't know what it says, and it's time to get in it, which brings me to, I'm glad you asked, the third thing of the way we live our lives. Listen to these verses following, all right? He goes down to 2 Timothy step, but evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse. What's he saying? This is going to get worse. They'll be deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you've learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you learned them, and that from childhood you've known the sacred writings which are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And then comes that powerful verse in regard to the end times. It's the one we use for a while, amen? All scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. Don't you, I love that last part. There's a work to be done in the, in the last days. There's a work to be done in these last days. But he said, how do we do that? It's done by staying in the truth, remaining in the word of God, trusting, believing, reading, standing on, and living out what God has said in the scriptures and in the word of God. This is what we need. This is where we stand. This is where most people go wrong though. They don't read it. They don't, they don't understand it. They, they don't believe it. They don't, they don't spend time in it. They don't pour their lives into it. But this still is the inerrant, infallible, living truth. It is from God. It speaks not only of God, God speaks in it. It's a living book. It's a dangerous book. It changes lives. It changes the world. That's why this book is banned in over 25% of the world today. 25% of the countries are more on the globe, in the world today. Will not let this book come in the borders. Why? Because if you get a hold of it, it's going to change you forever. They'd rather you go line up with the rest of the world, march your little way, your own direction, the way you desire to, and do whatever you'd want to do. But the word is your answer. It's powerful. Why do you think Satan hates the word of God? Because it's powerful. So don't sit back and say, well, you know, I, I had a relative tell me you know, recently about a pastor that showed him their wine cellar. They were doing some work at their house. A pastor of a very conservative evangelical church in our community goes down and shows his wine cellar. Church has run three or 4,000. Maybe I need to get me a wine cellar. <laughs> no, that's the point. Deacons, they know what to get the pastor and 
It's birthday and Christmas and New Year's. They bring him a fresh bottle of wine from somewhere in the world. But you'd be surprised how many pastors have gone that route in recent days. They've gone that route because everybody else said, well, Brother Joe, what's wrong with this? We'll talk about that later on. I think instead of wondering what's wrong with something, we ought to start finding out what's right with Jesus. Yes. What can I do to make a difference? What can I do to grow in grace? What can I do to be what God wants me to be? And quit saying, well, what, can I do this? Can I do that? Can I? Quit, get away from that. That's, a, that's the sure way to destruction. I mean, the old seminars used to go as Bill Goth, whoever it was, he used to have that great illustration about the king who wanted to hire a driver for his, for his chariot. And so he interviewed all these drivers for his chariot. He says, he says you know, the big cliff outside the, uh, just on the, the edge of the, the, the city out there. He says, yeah, he says, he says, how close can you come to the edge of that cliff? How close can you bring my wagon and, and my horses to that cliff without tumbling over? One guy said, well, I, I can come within a feet of it. I'm good. I can come within inches of it. One guy says, I stay away from it. That's the guy I hired. <laughs> See the difference? We're so interested what we can can't do this, can't do that. Now, you, can't, you haven't begun to discover the life of Jesus to discover all you get to do. You get to be filled with joy. You get to be a life changer. You get to be filled with purpose. You get to be filled with significance. Your life means something in Christ. It's not about, what am I going to do today? You know, how am I going to, you know, or where can I find another joint? Where can I get another drink? Where can I find another woman? Where can I, how can I make another buck? What an empty living that is. Amen. Your life is filled with God's will and God's purpose in your life. So what do you do? Well, you realize these are the last days. Avoid people that are not serious about their walk with Christ. Avoid churches that are not serious about the word of God and the gospel message. And stay true to the word of God. Amen. Amen. Let's stand with our heads bowed.